investment in fact checking in English. Um, but then those same claims were sometimes circulating in Spanish and people really would have benefited from having that article written in Spanish. So we created a tip line and it's through WhatsApp because we also know that there are a lot of Latino communities that are really active on WhatsApp and you can just forward the dodgy thing you saw from your aunt or whoever and we will try to answer you with a fact check. Because also that being a closed network, right? WhatsApp is not public, so it's harder for us to understand what people are talking about there. So if people forward that message to us, then we can send them back something and hopefully they can share it back to their network. Again, we really want to be a partner to people. Do you remember when I was a kid on a local news, they had this thing that was like seven on your side. And you would write in and they would investigate whatever they needed to do to investigate. Fact checking organizations are really interested in knowing what kind of claims you're confused about. We don't really want to be guessing for you. We, we can see when something is very, very, very viral, and we can assume that probably that needs addressing, but I much rather think of it as a reader service and be able to answer questions that people have. When someone writes me an email and is like, is this true? I immediately start looking into it. You know, that's a way more interesting story to me than something that I've come up with that I think like maybe they're not sure about. Um, so that is why I put those websites on the handout so that if you want to start asking questions, you can definitely, all of those organizations have ways to ask those questions. All right, this seems, speaking of questions about the time to let our audience in on the game. And um, so we have, Folks in, uh, who are Zooming, who will send their uh, questions through Jerry. Jerry, the uh, document in question was printed off with, I sent to Justine with the, um, the link. That's how it exists. But in any event, if we, if we fail to do it, uh, we'll make up for it. So since we have a hybrid program and I'm not running around with the microphone today, after I recognize you, stand up, give us your name, and in your best big voice, tell us your question, and I'll relay it for the digital audience. Well, thank you very much. You are. I am, and continue to be. <laughs> Mindy Reiser, and I'm a Mindy graduate Reiser. of the Columbia University School of Journalism, and I have uh, ventured in that world some. Fascinating, thank you both. I'd like your opinion on the whole world of editorials. We were talking about our reliance on our newspapers back home, back when, and I certainly read with interest the New York Times editorials, the Washington Post editorials. These are my local newspapers. What is your perception of the value of editorials? How biased might they be? And my second question is the future of print altogether with our concern about ecology and trees. Newspapers take up a lot of paper, especially Sunday issues. Thank so fire away. Mindy's question for our digital audience and maybe those of you in the back that didn't hear her is um, what about editorials and what about the future of print? Any comments? Okay, so there is a group called Trust in News, and they have been looking very carefully at editorials and what that means for your local newspaper audience or your local media audience. One thing is to make sure they're incredibly clearly labeled. So when you encounter them online, they should say really big and top something like opinion or editorial so that people come to them with the mindset of like, this is not a news story, this is an opinion. Um, there has been some recommendations that they've made that local papers should avoid editorials on national topics. Perhaps leave that to national papers and that local papers should have editorials about local issues, which is something that your editors would be more familiar with, something that would be more relevant to your audience and might be less polarizing. Um, 
And so that's some of the research that I've read recently that I think made sense to me, you know, not, not to say we should get rid of them, but to say, um, how do we make them work for the audience? Also, I think, you know, to have a very clear policy about who you choose, who your editorial writers will be, um, whether that's an editor's note that you have public somewhere or um, periodically your editorial board needs to explain how it comes around to those opinions, right? But th there's a lot of discussion of just more explaining to the public the making of the sausage, right? Helping people understand <laughs> how those decisions were made um, to, to boost trust. Uh, well, I, I just think that the, the there's nothing wrong with the uh, with the newspaper, you know, having uh, editorial page, having op page page for opinion. Uh, there's always that accusation by some observers that the editorial position creeps in. But you know, I, I don't know about other papers, but I remember that the Post had a policy of, of uh, separation of churches and state, so, so to speak, the firewall between the uh, editorial page and the, uh, and the newspaper, uh, news pages. Uh, I'm, the, the more opinion, the more judgment, and the more uh, credible in the sense that somebody has, who's written the editorial the op-ed has done a little bit of work uh, uh, to make it reasonable. Uh, I, I, I read, uh, William O. Douglas was uh, the great environmentalist and a uh, uh, member of the Supreme Court and uh, 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 was very much concerned about a highway going to take over the uh, CNO Canal, the towpath. Uh, and the editor, the, uh, the Washington Post editorial uh, page at that point was all for it. Go build the highway. Uh, and uh, what Douglas did was he invited the editorial board to come and walk the, uh, the trail. And the fact that they got out there and experienced it turned them around and they, in, they endorsed the protection of the CNO Canal. I'm sure there are people here who, in this room who are grateful uh, uh, for that. Uh, you mentioned the New York Times and the Washington Post. I do know, I, I recall that those editorial pages stayed with the uh, uh, Johnson uh, uh, Vietnam War uh, long after uh, uh, many people have, have given up the, uh, the, the, uh, the American involvement in, in that. So editorial boards, I think, have, have a have a useful uh, function, uh, uh, but but uh, and I don't know if that's what you were taught at Columbia, but uh, you graduate from great school of journalism. Marisha, want to take a crack at either of those questions, editorials, or the future of print? Well, to to the future of print, you know, from our customer base, but. They are struggling to pay wire services for their service, right? Like there's just fewer print news publications. And so uh, we have looked at other ways of making revenue as well, right? Like verification journalism is often funded by platforms that are looking for ways to have signals to police the content on their platforms. So many fact-checking organizations do receive funding from Meta, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, or from Twitter or TikTok. Um, there's a lot of concern in the newsroom about taking money from the platforms, but it does give you a, a way to talk to them, a way to bring journalism to them and to try and hold them accountable. You know, it's not like I'm gonna be in a room with Mark Zuckerberg, but I am gonna be in a room with someone who reports to someone who reports to someone who reports to Mark Zuckerberg, right? So hopefully um, they do use those fact-checking articles as signals. If we tell them you have this false claim circulating on your platform, they will take algorithmic action against that post. So you should hopefully see it less in 
your news feed, and it should have some kind of warning on it if a fact checker has. It'll say, this post was found false by an independent fact checking organization. Would you like to see why? And it will give you the option to read the fact checking article. Um, you can still share it, you can still um, engage with the content, but at least there is a little bit of friction there to try to keep you from passing it on uncritically. Um, but to the future of printer, I don't know, I still subscribe to a newspaper newspaper, I'm, but I'm not that young anymore. So <laughs> I don't think that my younger colleagues do. You know, we, we have, we used to also get physical clips in the newspaper of, uh, you know, from newspapers from around the world that use AFP content. And I don't think that they do that much anymore, so. Before we go to the next question, could you just tell us, uh, do any uh, publications that circulate in the United States subscribe to your wire service? Certainly. So where, can we see, where can we see this? So uh, AFP photos are probably what is most well known in the United States because the, the New York Times uses AFP photos, Time Magazine uses AFP photos. They are, um, we are really, really renowned photo journalists, like to the point that I didn't even think I should ever post on Instagram because my colleagues are all such amazing photographers. Um, but in terms of our text wire, it can be used also as like a signal. So like um, a radio station might subscribe to a wire service and it's sort of like a heads up, you know, because wire services were always in the business of publishing what they knew as soon as they knew it. They never waited for like a print deadline. So um, you could have a notification alert. There's been an explosion in whatever place, a train has derailed somewhere. And so you might hear like on CNN every now and then they'll say, the French news agency is reporting blah, 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 blah. And that's because they must subscribe to the AFP wire, right? Um, most of the print publications that use AFP articles are actually English language in English, of course, in French it's very different, but in English are a lot of English language newspapers in Asia. Um, have a lot of English language newspaper clients in Asia that I guess are read by expats that are living in Asia and places like that. Um, of course, in French, AFP is the national wire service, the national service, they have a journalist in every province. And I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very well positioned in French. So. All right. Uh, Jerry, do you have a question for us from the, nothing from there. Let's look around the room. Barbara, your biggest voice. My name is Barbara Diskin. My question is, have either of you ever made a really big mistake and what were the consequences of it? Barbara Diskin ferociously asks. Are we dealing with truth? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Either of you ever made a big mistake and what were the consequences? I, uh, uh, I don't think, I, in, in terms, as a, I've made a lot of mistakes in life, but I don't know, as, as a journalist, I can remember in, in, uh, in uh, 1960, in the uh, presidential campaign, presidential campaign, I was sent to cover a speech by a Republican senator, uh, John Sherman Cooper, a marvelous guy, uh, uh, Republican. And it was very close to our last deadline. I think we ran three or four editions. And so I got sent to some hotel to cover uh, the speech by the senator. And so he was talking about the, uh, the two candidates, Kennedy uh, and, and, and Nixon. And I heard him say that Dick Nixon didn't know anything about agriculture. And I did not, Stop for a moment. I, you know, I wrote that down accurately. That's what the that's what uh, Senator Cooper said. And then, because it was on deadline, 
uh, I either called it in or went back. I probably called it in for the last edition, and that's the way it ran. And nobody, no, nobody challenged it. Uh, and the next morning, I got a call, and it was from the publisher, Barry Bingham. And Barry Bingham and I were did not make, make a lot of phone calls, you know, between each other, but there was a call from the publisher and, and John Sherman Cooper was his house guest. <laughs> and, 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 and Cooper told him about what he had read in the Louisville Times, the last edition. And so he said, you know, I, what I really meant was to say Kennedy. Kennedy didn't know anything, I, not Nixon, you know. And so, but it was the mildest kind of come up it's a person could receive, you know. There was no letter to the editor, nothing like that. And so that's that's one that comes to mind. Uh, and I guess it's haste makes waste, but you know, it, it's a whole element of competition. And and if I might, I I, I would like to ask another question. May, may I ask another question uh, about? Deadline, you have competition. What do you do when you when you're checking something and you know the 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 opposition, the AP or voters or somebody's got how do you deal with that? <laughs> in, in case you, people didn't hear that, you're a little off mic. Uh, the question again with the microphone. Oh with the microphone. Oh, into the mic. Thank you. I was asking about competition. Uh, you know, deadline, you're on deadline, right? And you and the competition you know has got this thing story and you're still verifying what do you do to meet the competition and the, and the time constraint time is one of the biggest enemies of fact checking because it's very simple to make something up and very difficult to verify it especially if you're verifying something that never happened or you know trying to not just and, it, and you know it's not just a denial it's not like you can just say okay this was claimed about the government the government says it's not true that's not a fact check that's a denial so you've got to get even a, another source to um also say if that's not plausible that's not possible right um what i will say about fact checking that i like as a part of journalism is that it is slightly less competitive in this way about deadlines and scoops and whatever, because I do think it's a little bit more mission driven and we're all like, okay, the big enemy is disinformation. We're all working to try to counter that. How do we get to that as quickly as possible? Um, it is true that we might be working on the same claim as another fact-checking organization, but I think there's slightly less, you know, I mean, the idea of like, I would just like to take this, take this claim down as quickly as possible because I don't want people to believe something that's patently untrue a little bit less than like I need to do it faster than the AP or my boss will be mad at me um so and and there have been a lot of big collaborations with fact-checking organizations especially when we know that something is going to be in multiple languages so uh we might contact a fact-checking organization in Taiwan or Iraq or Georgia or the Ukraine or somewhere for help and they will actually help because they don't want that same claim to be circulating in your language as well if they've already debunked it in their language um, so there is a little bit less of a but certainly my colleagues that are on the main news desk are very much under time pressure and you know, there was a recent editorial meeting where they're just like, of course, accuracy first, accuracy first, accuracy first, but be fast, <laughs> be as fast as you can, you know? And so uh, some of that is about preparation, right? Because they're covering news events that they know will happen. So how much can you prepare if you're going to a speech? What are your three background paragraphs about why this speech is being made? And who's making it, that could already be written so that all you need is the quote from the speech. But um, when it's news happening on the fly, it's just, it, that that's when that tension between accuracy and speed really comes into play. I can't let you off the hook. 
Was there ever an error that you want to talk about? <laughs> so the worst possible thing that can happen to you at a wire service is a kill, which is when your story completely has to be withdrawn. Um, not you know, like not a correction. We could correct that, but like when they're like, no, we need to take this down. And I have had one of those in my fact checking career, and it haunts me all the time. And I, it, it was a meme about the boreal forest in Canada. I won't go into the details, but um, you know, we talked about over the. It, and of course, it went out on a Friday. So then I got a call Saturday morning. Oh, we've gotten five emails that are pointing out problems with this story, and I'm like, oh no, and. Um, and we looked at it. Were there? Could we do a correction? You know, I, I wrote through the whole story. I said, "Here, I think I corrected it. Please, could we?" And, and the editor essentially said, "This is not a topic that we should have even attempted to fact check. We're going to kill this." And I, and I, you know, the reporter was upset about it. I was upset about it. We were. It's very devastating. <laughs> I'm sorry, and you're living the it, trauma. It, it sits. It sits on the. It sits, but it doesn't say kill. At least on our website on the correction page it says this story was withdrawn <laughs> <laughs> but it is there all right uh jerry anything from zoom land um, we know our usual protocol for clearing the dishes so once we're finished are there more questions Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Ellen has a question. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, don't clear your dishes. <laughs> Wait for the question. Thank you for your patience with us. Um, let me try to be fair to the side of the room. Very simple question. I've seen um, explanations. Your name? Oh, I'm Helen X. And this is a very simple, basic question, but I've seen explanations that there's a difference between misinformation and disinformation. And while it's mainly misinformation here in speaking about it, you also have used the term disinformation. And there seems to be a difference, at least to the minds of the people who wrote the explanations that I read. Could you speak to that? Speak to misinformation between those and terms. disinformation. Right, so um, in academic research, they are very clear to make the distinction, right? And um, disinformation being something that you intentionally put out into the world, knowing it was false, trying to fool people. And that could be coordinated by a foreign government. That could be a person who is staunchly anti-vaccine, who makes a claim that they know to be unfounded. Um, that is usually how we define disinformation, right? That you are intending to deceive and you did it with intention. Um, whereas misinformation could be just wiggling the facts in your direction, or it could be inadvertently resharing something that you just didn't take the time to pause and check. So you might be spreading it you might be misinforming by spreading something, but you didn't even realize that it wasn't true. Or um, so those are kind of that's my. I hope that's your. Yeah, that was my understanding. <laughs> of the distinction that I just. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions, Mr. Gore. Um, Martin Gore, this is Brett from Howard Bray. What do you tell young people who want to go to J school to be a journalist? I'm Mark Gordon asks, a writer, but a journalist. Mark Gordon asks, what do you tell people at J School who want to be journalists? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> if, if that's what you want to do, do it. Uh, yeah, you uh, you're essential to our society. If you do it well and honestly. I think that's going to stand for both of them, maybe three of us. Go ahead. Uh, Andy Narva. So uh, lying and uh, the need for the press to protect us against lying uh, is not new. And it's 
hard to know whether things are worse now than they were. How would you contrast the press's uh, response to McCarthy with the press's response to Trump? Who are the biggest liars in the last century? <laughs> Uh, let me just <laughs> send that question over to the uh, Zoom audience. Sorry, Carla. Yes, yes. Howard, let me just get the question in for the folks at home. Um, what how, do you, how do you contrast? Well, I, I, I heard our, our I, I heard the question. I heard they the, didn't. Oh, that's what I'm saying. The Zoom audience hasn't heard it, and I just wanted to express it. Uh, the question for Mandy Garland was uh, how do you compare the lying? Uh, in the McCarthy era with modern era Trumpism. And how does the press is functioning? And the press, I'm sorry, the press function in regard to both. You know, Joe McCarthy went out to West Virginia and he said, I've got what, 46 names or, you know, of all these counties in the State Department, something like that. And, you know, I don't think there was any fact checking. Uh, uh, Marisha wasn't on duty uh, <laughs> you know, that night. But, uh, so that, that got triggered. But I also remember what uh, Joe and Stuart Olsop did. And I think it was in the Saturday Evening Post thing when they wrote Jacques. And it was a play on Emil Zola and uh, uh, the Zenger trial. Uh, right. But in right. any case, what they were saying was McCarthy's, you know, bad stuff. And uh, uh, and it was a very powerful in, in, indictment. Uh, it didn't stop the coverage of, of him, but you know he he worked himself out eventually. You know he was uh, an alcoholic. He had other other problems, but uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, but the press still printed what McCarthy said. Uh, the, uh, would they be any more, less cautious? I don't know. Uh, 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 the, the press still covered uh, Donald Trump and it still covers him. He was president of the United States. He is a major force in American politics. You, uh, you have to put things in context and so forth. But uh, the newspapers printed what McCarthy asserted. Uh, But, but I, you, you may want to add to that. You may have some particular thought, uh, th thoughts about that, 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 that period. No, it's just, it's, it seems, things seem bad right now, but it's hard to know. It always seems bad. The present time always feels bad. I'm, I'm looking for some historical perspective to, to, to validate what I tell my kids, which is, you know, this is bad, but it's really not that much worse than what was happening in McCarthy. Uh, in terms of um, disseminating lies about people and it being bought for a while. So I guess I'm looking for some reassurance from your perspective, because I was not conscious when McCarthy was there. <laughs> right. You know, uh, uh, I, I think, I think just, I, I guess I'd say if Joe McCarthy had uh, what uh, Donald Trump had, uh, and has and all this media. God knows, God knows where we would where, where we uh, we be. Uh, uh, McCarthy ran his course. I remember there were other. You know, remember who was he confronted by? I know there was a an army, the you know, army major. Uh, he was he went after some army major. He went after the secretary of the army. But yeah. I think we're not going to have time okay. for the full answer, and okay. we give Marisha the last word. Yeah. Oh, give me the last word on that topic. I'm I'm not feeling super confident to address, but uh, what no, what I would say is it it's still really a struggle in newsrooms to talk about saying someone lied. There's a lot of trickiness even to say this claim is false very decisively in our articles. And it gives some of the newsroom heart palpitations for us to um, definitely make those very clear cut delineations. You know, we don't want to write around it. We want to say this is false. Um, so 
I think I think it's just the tension between journalism wanting to be objective and wanting to make sure it's heard all perspectives at the same time wanting to say that's baseless and that's very complicated and it does take a lot of um, a lot of discussion in the newsroom. <laughs> Thank you so much, Howard and Marisha. It's been fun for both of you.